Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to have this occasion to speak to you here at the IEEE Radar Conference about our radar research at the Fraunhofer Institute for High Frequency Physics and Radar Techniques. It is a pity, really, that we cannot meet in person in such a nice venue and environment as Florence. I would have really liked that. I hope that the situation will improve soon enough for us to make up for this opportunity and meet in person again sometime soon. Before we start with the presentation, I would like to give you a quick overlook about the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, our umbrella society. Fraunhofer is running more than 70 institutes uh, in Germany, all focused on a different research topic. And uh, with its uh, almost 30,000 uh, employees, we have an annual turnover of almost 3 billion euros. And what is important for research at Fraunhofer is that our research is application oriented. So typically the research is um, dedicated to an application in industry uh, fields. And uh, it is also typical that more than 70% of our annual turnover are made from industry contracts or from uh, public, publicly financed research projects. Our institute, FHR, the Fraunhofer Institute for High Frequency Physics and Radar Techniques, has a history of more than uh, five decades in developing custom-tailored solutions for radar systems and electromagnetic sensors. It was founded back in 1957 and uh, in the meantime there are working 340 employees uh, with an annual budget of 35 million euros and we focus on system designs and demonstrators for new radar applications. We develop all the required signal processing and imaging methods and we do technology consulting, for example, in uh, defense projects or uh, civilian applications of radar techniques uh, in industry. For this purpose, we have a lot of uh, state-of-the-art equipment for measurement, for rapid prototyping, for integrated circuit design and packaging, computing and many more. Whatever is required is there. In my presentation today, I will first give you an introduction um, with our advances in digital and fully integrated radar, especially for millimeter wave applications and our work in radar networks and synchronization between different radar nodes. I will also show you, not necessarily in this order, several applications in the field of security, in automotive radar, in vital parameter detection and monitoring and in radar for space situational awareness. Let's first have a look at the advances in digital radar over the last decades. With every new generation of integrated circuits, we have an increase of computing performance and we see a new generation also of application in information and communication technology. And we can now use this uh, very, very high computing performance also for radar applications. We have the ability to have mixed signal RFICs where analog and digital components are integrated in a small package and that opens up a lot of new dedicated solutions. Here is a look at the past. This is what electronic radar looked like uh, 40 years ago. In the early 1970s, our uh, predecessors in the uh, FFM built uh, the ELRA system, the first radar with electronically steered phased array antenna in Europe. It had 768 receive elements organized in 48 subarrays and it had digital receive channels for radar operation in real time. A few years later, also full digital beamforming was added in the extension called EBIRA. And that was the past, but we are still working in the field of uh, arrays with other technology at hand. 
Here is an example of our present work. Today we have the means to design a fully integrated compact radar system on a chip, in this case working at 240 gigahertz. It's fabricated on Infineon silicon germanium by CMOS technology. We have a wideband radar system with all the important components signal generation, transmitter, receiver and even the antennas included in a small package. And we have also the computing power at hand to perform real-time operation. We can do heterogeneous architectures with high throughput and high uh, performance for digital signal processing, for example by using FPGA or GPU processors. And this combination opens up a new number and a new area of uh, low cost and also everyday life applications. And a good example for this is a project run by the Google company. Maybe you have heard about the project Zoli, where we have um, a millimeter wave multi-channel radar integrated on a single chip. And, uh, the radar signal processing is done uh, by the power of the cloud and uh, this simple system recognizes different gestures. Uh, for example, when the smartphone is inside a jacket or in a distance to control the device. And this is a single example for what I would call truly ubiquitous radar where radar becomes a sensor that uh, can find many new places in everyday life. And I think that once these simple uh, and low-cost systems are at hand, clever people will find a lot uh, of new applications where nobody thought of yet. I will now show you some examples of our work in the field of highly integrated technology for millimeter wave radar. And one very nice example is this, uh, what we call MIMO camera, operating at 120 gigahertz. Here you see the system overview. Yeah? You see a MIMO radar with 24 transmit uh, and receive channels organized in a non-equidistant MIMO uh, cylindrical array fashion that can be used for 3D imaging similar to a still camera. And uh, we have a compact overall size uh, that is desirable especially for mobile operation with a high degree of system integration and also here we apply our silicon germanium design for an integrated MMIC chipset. Here we look at this chipset uh, with a little more detail. We have three main core chips. One is the transmit chip that you see at the top with four transmit channels each. We have uh, the signal generation in the VCO chip and a 1 by 8 power divider. And we have a quad pack receiver chip where the down conversion and the quadruple chain is visible at the image at the bottom. And with that we can uh, operate a system for many different applications. Here we have some examples in the field of uh, security and safety. At the top you see the system mounted in front of uh, what looks like a rock slide and you see that you have, let me use this pointer here, you see the rock slide here, the system mounted here and you see a radar image, yeah, the uh, black and white intensity distribution that you obtain. But what you cannot show there is that you also get a 3D information about uh, the scenario from um, the real aperture scanning of this MIMO array. Other applications are for indoor. Here you see the system in uh, one of our labs. And you see here the radar image that shows a 2D illustration showing furniture, the back wall of the room, the door and similar detail. And in the third example here towards the right you see one of the colleagues and you can see that the system can also scan an image of the person with some more detail and maybe some uh, information uh, similar to a person scanner. And this is the basis for a number of interesting applications 
for example, in um, support for emergency forces or for industry automation using robotics. Other applications in industry are also the precise surface reconstruction yeah, for quality control and quality assurance. Here we have a 3D image of a surface where the illustration shows that we can achieve a submillimeter accuracy using the phase information of the signal. Yeah, we have an overall accuracy of 100 micron at 80 gigahertz and if we move this technology to higher frequencies with uh, smaller wavelengths we can even increase this. Here is an example where we used this system for the control of the surface of a car yeah, and you can see that the sensor notices very subtle deformations in the surface and uh, this is very important and very helpful also for quality control in industry processes. Another field of application is um, airborne imaging radar, uh, where we closely cooperate with one of our sister institute, the Fraunhofer IAF, where we uh, obtain very powerful high performance uh, integrated circuits for millimeter wave systems at highest frequencies and here we show you some uh, work done with the Miranda 94 gigahertz system to explore circular SAR, circular synthetic aperture radar. Yeah, here at the bottom you see the front end integrated in a stabilized mount. Here you see the carrier platform, um, a small aircraft that can carry the front end and this mount. And we have an onboard computer that does uh, the signal processing on board. And of course, before flight, everything has to be put into an aerodynamic package. And the benefits of such a system is that you can get a 360 degree overview of the target region with a minimum of shadowing and you can adjust the viewing angle optimum to the target. Uh, you can obtain a very high resolution within the, the range of the wavelength at a high frame rate and you can also get 3D image reconstruction with a single channel system. Uh, you can use it for moving target indication and uh, similar techniques and you can get 3D information from the observation of the shadow inside parts of the scene. The disadvantage is that the uh, flight trajectory is uh, a little more ambitious and that you need a very high precision uh, IMU and information about this trajectory in order to do the processing uh, at the required accuracy. Here you see the results of this experimental campaign and uh, we cooperated here with the Technical University of, Mo uh, of Munich and uh, we addressed the important aspect of stabilization of the sensor and the precision control of the flight path yeah, where you need uh, a fraction of the wavelength at 94 gigahertz and Munich developed the control algorithms um, together with us and what you see here at the left hand side is this radar image uh, of a circular SAR campaign uh, at the bottom you see the uh, photo image and um, the RF bandwidth used in this experiment was 2 gigahertz that gives you a resolution in uh, the 10 centimeter range. Another application of uh, millimeter wave imaging radar is the self-localization of a vehicle that we show here with this uh, example called ZANAV. We obtain a SAR image from the sensor, in this case our Miranda 35 sensor, and we simulate a failure of GPS or any other uh, self-localization using GNSS 
and uh, we rely on the data from the uh, SAR image to identify the position of the aircraft. And uh, this can be very helpful in case you think of self-driving vehicles or some other um, unmanned uh, vehicles where they also need um, a unique and reliable position information in case the external and cooperative cooperation means like GNSS are not available. Another field of research for our colleagues is the field of bi-static, multi-static and passive radar. Yeah, several of you know that we have been working in this field for several decades and that we have developed demonstrators to show that passive radar can work with uh, the available sources of opportunity like TV transmitters or radio transmitters. And even though there are commercial systems available, it is still a field of research because it's very interesting. Yeah, the um, advantage is that you don't need uh, a radar transmitter for the radar operation because you rely on these external sources, so there is no uh, permission required and you don't add anything to the congestion of the electromagnetic spectrum. But these techniques only become available due to the advances in digital technology where we now have the processing power to address this not only for defense but also for several civilian applications. Yeah? For example at the left hand side you see our parasol system which is uh, a passive radar that can be equipped to uh, wind farms and then detect approaching aircrafts and help to switch on and off the illumination of these wind turbines in order to protect aircraft. Our research today is now focused on different sources of illumination. Yeah, for example, here we have a system that uses uh, the faint signal of geostationary satellite illuminators, here in this case digital video broadcasting satellites um, that are available. And you see that with these signals we are able to detect uh, approaching small uh, UAV or UAS, yeah, micro drones. And uh, you can also see that with the uh, Doppler spectrum that we get for example from a hexacopter or for different vehicles approaching, we can do different measurements and these micro Doppler patterns can be used to discriminate the individual type of the approaching UAV and this could be later used as one method for the identification and classification of the targets. And we are also working on bringing passive radar onto moving vehicles, yeah, which is quite a challenge due to the required synchronization and also the precise localization information that is required. But we have here a demonstrator showing that we can use a passive radar also to obtain images from the ground. And uh, you see here at the left uh, the, the demonstrator system in the pod. You see again our experimental aircraft that was used for this uh, experiment. And we obtained um, a synthetic aperture image from a scene with an 8 megahertz digital bandwidth yeah, that, that is available in one channel. And you see at the right hand side an overlay from the optical image and the passive radar image. Yeah, and it's uh, a little difficult in this illustration to separate the two. But uh, the message is that the uh, radar image and the optical photograph match very well with uh, the important detail at the right places. Of course, the resolution from the 8 megahertz channel is, uh, is, is not comparable to the photograph, but uh, we are also working on combining multiple channels and multiple ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum in order to enhance this resolution.
Yeah, we also work in the field of uh, automotive radar, especially for what we call advanced driver assistance systems. And um, ra radar is a key sensor in these systems, especially when you think about self-driving vehicles, yeah? because it's the sensor that is available at, under almost all weather conditions, uh, 24 hours a day. So this is the information that self-driving vehicles need. And some examples of what we are working um, on is shown here. Yeah, we are in a project that is called Radar for Autonomous Dri Driving, Radar for FAT, uh, uh, where we are cooperating together with uh, Infineon, uh, some automotive car manufacturers and many other partners in uh, signal processing algorithms based on compressive sensing here. We have um, developed these novel signal processing schemes for a better uh, direction of arrival estimation with high angular resolution. And um, we also assess the height dimensions of approaching objects and objects at the road. Um, at the same time, uh, there is also a reduction of cost achieved with these signal processing schemes. Yeah, what are the advantages? You can get a high resolution and a high angular accuracy. Um, it's suited for different array geometries, like the sparse or MIMO arrays, two-dimensional, or even conformal arrays uh, that can be used. And the algorithm is fast at the same time using less memory uh, and it's relatively robust to uh, external noise and phase errors. When you think about automotive radar and self-driving cars, then another question is how do you make sure that the sensor does its jobs and that all the information that you get is accurate and reliable? And one system that we are developing since a couple of, of years is a testing environment for automotive radar and, and similar radar systems. Yeah? This project is called Atrium. And the idea is that you can place uh, an, a car or some other vehicle equipped with uh, automotive radar in some kind of a radar cinema. And then in this cinema, you have the ability to play radar signals uh, for simulating a realistic scene to the radar sensors at the target and at the vehicle. Yeah, and we can place these virtual radar targets along angle and range, so we can play a two-dimensional complex uh, radar scene where we also uh, include different types of radar targets, not only point targets, but the uh, either measured or th simulated signatures of different participants in traffic, like cars, small vehicles like cycles, or even pedestrians. And we have the hardware now for simulating complex scenes with more than 100 uh, scatterers included. And we can do a full simulation of uh, critical traffic scenarios and we can replay it in case we want to test the algorithms inside the car, inside the sensors uh, and how they react. One key also to this uh, test scenario is a fast and accurate electromagnetic simulation of dynamic traffic scenarios. And for this purpose, we have developed a uh, GoPoSim. Yeah? It's based on geometric and physical optics uh, asymptotic electromagnetic simulation techniques. And we have achieved, or we want to achieve, uh, faster than real-time simulation. Up to now, I would say almost real-time simulation. But in this simulation, we have uh, included the uh, signatures and the movement of these uh, different participants in traffic and um, we can also verify and have also verified these simulations in realistic measurement. A very simple example is shown here for two cars passing by 
And uh, this is also an example for an experimental verification of the system. At the top left you see uh, the video camera image from the car taking over. At the bottom you see the range Doppler map from the automotive radar included in this car. At the right hand side you see the range Doppler map generated by simulation. And at the bottom you see the point scatterers generated in the Atrium systems for this simulation. And uh, in the center you see a graphical representation of the situation, which I will now start. Here you see the camera, the radar sensor, the GoPro SIM and the hardware uh, with the point scatterers. And now the car passes by and you see the movement in the range Doppler map. Yeah, and the simulation is short and we could go on a little longer but I think for the moment this will do. Another important topic for research is how to discriminate the different participants in a traffic scenario and especially pedestrians, cyclists and other participants which are endangered must be protected. And we have one project called HORIS where we want to provide emergency alert to approaching cars in case, for example, a pedestrian is crossing the street uh, behind a bus. And uh, here we are developing algorithms for the detection of pedestrians and we are also here comparing our simulated data with real experimental data. And we can use both data sets to train neural networks for the classification. Yeah, here we see another uh, simulation example. It's a person standing and uh, the person and the human gait is re represented by a, a point grid model. And at the left hand side you see the variation of the Doppler shift over time. And uh, let me start this. Here you see now the movement starts and you see the micro Doppler variation over time in the illustration. And uh, when you compare these simulations to real data, you see that the uh, important effects are included. And this is the basis for the um, classification that we need in this uh, context. Yeah, another interesting topic um, with a high significance, especially now in a pandemic situation, is the detection of vital parameters and the monitoring of vital parameters using radar. Also we here we have a number of uh, projects going on and here we show you a different MIMO radar module uh, with a high three-dimensional spatial resolution that we use for the localization of people in a standoff scenario uh, deducing their vital parameters in the measurement. Yeah, you see a scenario of two people uh, moving to the left and from this radar measurement we can obtain both the pulse variation and also the breathing frequency. And uh, here this is the uh, comparison from uh, real measurements and we were able to abstract, uh, obtain from these measurements the respiration signal shown at the top and uh, the pulse signal shown at the bottom and the variation over time. And of course we compared this data to uh, ground truths, to real uh, uh, other sources and we obtained a 1% accuracy in comparison to commercial activity trackers. And uh, such work has also a high significance in an emergency uh, disaster recovery scenario. Here we use um, similar techniques but with a lower frequency radar at around 1 gigahertz uh, from airborne platforms. So the radar is uh, used in a UAV to detect buried people in search and rescue missions in this project Lupe Plus, which is funded by the German Ministry of uh, Education and Research. 
The last application that I would like uh, to highlight today is an important topic for our uh, institute and that is radar for space situational awareness. You know that our society relies heavily on the um, functioning of services based on infrastructure in space. Communication, navigation, security services, they all rely on satellites. And uh, what would happen if these satellites suddenly stop to work? Yeah, and there is a very nice program that was uh, developed by the British BBC a couple of years ago. At first you would maybe not notice, but um, then very soon you discover how much relies on the functioning of these satellites and how much our society relies on this infrastructure. And um, there are different threats to our satellites and one um, one significant threat is the topic of space debris. Yeah? And uh, space debris are man-made objects brought into the Earth orbits, remaining there for a long time. And uh, because they are moving at high speeds in the same orbits as also the satellites, they are a danger and could damage or even destroy satellites. I can show you the development uh, of this threat over time because in 1957, when the first satellite, the Sputnik, was launched, there was no uh, space debris yet. But over time, the situation has changed. The European uh, Space Agency has a master catalogue that shows that 60 years later, in 2009, we already had more than uh, 700,000 objects estimated bigger than one centimeters and even 18,500 bigger than 10 centimeters. Yeah, and uh, that is a size where the objects can uh, destroy satellites and pose a significant threat. And uh, that this threat is real uh, can be observed uh, in accidents which happen from time to time. A good example is uh, this accident that happened to the uh, Sentinel-1A Earth Observation Satellite operated by ESA. And it was in August 2016 when the engineers suddenly noticed uh, an unusual movement of the satellite and also a drop of the voltage. And um, when they compared the video footage from before and after the accident, they saw that uh, where you see the red arrow, there was a little bump inside the panel that hasn't been there previously. And they estimated that this hole of about 40 centimeter size has been caused by a collision with a small millimeter sized space debris particle. So the uh, danger is there and the society is currently looking for ways to protect satellites against space debris and such threats. And while techniques to remove the space debris are still very costly and in an early stage, uh, the only thing we can do is use our sensors on the ground to observe the space uh, situation and the space debris uh, population in order to make a forecast. And radar systems for space observation are the key to cataloging these debris particles and filling the databases regularly with accurate data. For this purpose we are operating two different types of radar. One is what we call mechanically steered wideband radar a powerful radar with a large bandwidth that can be moved to determine uh, accurate orbits and that can also uh, uh, use its high bandwidth to obtain radar images of the space objects, for example, in space reconnaissance. The other type is a more agile electronically scanned array that has a large field of view and can uh, have a supervision, a surveillance of larger areas of space simultaneously. And for that 
we need a multi-beam and multi-mode operation so that for a certain region of space we can make sure that a 24-7 operation is available continuously. And I'll show you these systems that we have in our institute. One is the tracking and imaging radar TIRA. Yeah, that uh, is a system that is, has been uh, uh, in operation also since uh, almost 50 years. It is um, very accurate in positioning. It has a 34 meter uh, diameter parabolic dish antenna and it operates two different radars an, a high power L band radar for the tracking and uh, position determination and um, a KU band radar with uh, a bandwidth giving you a better resolution than 20 centimeters for imaging. And here I'll show you one of these radar images as an example. It is the, um, an ISA image of the Envisat, yeah, a satellite that had a communication breakdown back in April 2012 and uh, was lost since. And we did uh, an investigation to find out about the solar panel and we could show in these ISAR images that we obtained that the solar panel was still there and operating or at least directed into the specific direction of the sun. This is the resolution that we have today and we are working towards an increase of resolution by migrating also the um, antenna to, towards higher frequency bands. The other radar that we have been developing uh, since more than five years is a phased array radar, an active electronically scanned radar that is called the German Experimental Space Surveillance and Tracking Radar, GESTRA. And um, this is a monostatic pulsed phased array. It also operates in the L-band at around 1.3 gigahertz because the idea is that we can also combine this system with the other radar, the TIRA. And that was especially designed for space surveillance in the low Earth orbits up to distances of 3000 kilometers. Here we have a combination of mechanical and electronic beam steering for full flexibility and a surveillance of a full hemisphere around the radar. And uh, we have two subsystems, a transmitter and a receiver in uh, separated um, shelters for a better insulation. Uh, at the bottom you see an image of the array antenna with uh, the uh, different elements of the uh, phased array. At the top you see one of these shelters at uh, the final destination. GESTRA was designed as a digital beam forming system with a high flexibility, uh, also as a software defined radar where we can uh, make sure that different modes of operation for different applications can be implemented also at a later stage. Yeah, it uh, has freely programmable radar beams and you can for example generate a, a point-like or a fence-like search volume. You can scan different areas with uh, scalable sensitivity for scaling also the probability of detection. We have a track while scan mode after uh, an object is detected and um, special modes for dual polarization and increased bandwidth are also under development. And this system um, has been finalized, or almost finalized, I should say, uh, this year. The system is now uh, shipped and has been shipped to its final destination uh, near Koblenz in Germany. And here you see a video from this uh, location. And uh, it has received its first signals from space objects in November 2019 in a joint experiment with the TIRA radar. And now at this site it is being calibrated and uh, when the calibration is finished it will be handed over to the German Space Situational Awareness Center and operated remotely by this center uh, in autumn to 2020. 
For these systems, we are also thinking about how to improve the sensitivity and how to find smaller debris particles. And um, you all know the radar equation that you see at the top and uh, to increase the signal to noise ratio, you ca can go of course different ways with higher power in the transmitter, with higher antenna gains. But we are looking at the use of cryogenic cooling in order to reduce the noise figure of the system. Yeah? And um, up to now only few activities uh, have been um, uh, reported in radar uh, applications. And our work here is to build an L-band dewer that is cryogenically cooled and contains um, as a demonstrator a seven element uh, receiver array. And um, in this dewer we can cool the system temperature down to um, 170K Kelvin for the antenna. And uh, in a second stage to 17 Kelvin for the low noise amplifiers. It may sound easy, but uh, a lot of challenges uh, has to be overcome in order to reach such a low temperature and uh, to deal with such high temperature differences. You cannot use, for example, normal copper wires, but you have to use special um, materials like phosphor bronze or manganin. You have to consider the shrinking uh, factor um, that shrinks all your devices and you have to design antennas, for example, with uh, respect to this uh, shrinking in advance. And also you need very low surface roughness, very smooth materials in order to reach this high vacuum. Um, last not least, you need special temperature sensors which still operate at such low temperatures. And uh, in an experimental setup, we have prepared a so-called dewer, yeah, a cabinet for an array and the array measurements. And uh, in this dewer, we have a high vacuum chamber with a radome cover for the measurements. We have a seven element antenna array similar to the one in Gestra with cryogenically cooled receivers implemented. The system frequency is in the L-band with a 20% bandwidth and we need cool down times of about two days because the high volume needs to be cooled. And uh, the overall achievement is uh, a reduction of the uh, sensitivity about 3 dB, so you get a 3 dB better uh, signal to noise ratio and there is still room for improvement. And for all our applications, for several of the ones that I showed you and for several uh, that we are also working on, radar networks and the synchronization of the nodes inside a network is also an important topic. Yeah, from simple groups of independent radar sensors, radar and others, we go to a, a complex multifunctional uh, and uh, multi-static network. And that means that we use um, either external communication means like Ethernet or Wi-Fi uh, access or emergency services radio in order to transfer information between the nodes or uh, even to synchronize uh, the timing base, the time base inside these uh, nodes. Yeah, and we look at both synchronization, yeah, where we use, for example, the precision time protocol to make sure that the time base is the same, or syntonization, where we use protocols like White Rabbit to measure the time difference between uh, the different nodes and um, still be able to synchronize this, the received data. And we need distributed processing on multiple sensors in order to obtain the full advantage of such networks. And the advantage is a better situational awareness because with more sensors you have a higher uh, awareness, you have a, a bigger field of view and you can achieve 
a, a, with a better synchronization, also an increased signal to noise ratio if you're able to have the stable time base in the required order of magnitude. Uh, the photograph in the center shows you that here we have a synchronization performance in the order of one microsecond. That is what you can uh, see, achieve, for example, about Ethernet or Wi-Fi uh, with uh, not a big effort. But that's not enough if you're looking at higher frequencies, especially in the uh, upper uh, gigahertz range and millimeter wave range. One of the applications uh, that we are dealing with here is uh, um, networking of radar sensors for uh, protection of uh, critical infrastructure. For example, here in this ORAS, uh, um, ORAS project funded by the German Ministry of uh, Education and Research. And uh, this system is a 60 gigahertz radar um, that uh, is in the unlicensed ISM band. Uh, it has a very low phase noise and uh, is able to detect um, even micro UAS against heavy clutter. And it's very compact. Yeah? It's uh, a small package below 2 kilograms. And uh, because of the open protocol that was implemented, it, it can be integrated into existing sensor suits easily. And uh, synchronization is an important topic there to increase the um, situational awareness. Synchronization is also a topic for our space surveillance radar. Yeah? I already told you that the TIRA and GESTRA radars are designed to operate in the same frequency band and synchronization is an important, top important topic there. But uh, radar networks with a very precise synchronization are also required if we want to build up bigger networks. Yeah, th maybe there will be more sensors for space situational awareness uh, at a later stage. And uh, for that we are developing modular building blocks um, where we can increase the performance gain for detection, orbit estimation and orbit determination in a network where different nodes of the network can also be placed in different parts of the world um, in order to increase the field of view of the overall system. Yeah? And um, the challenges here, as I mentioned, are to get a stable, robust and reliable time, frequency and phase base for synchronization and to transfer the data reliably so that we can use it for correlation and fusion of the data. If you like, um, you can follow the development of these projects and others over the social media. Here are a few links and uh, if you look at our webpage, you find the uh, correct addresses as well. I could go on and tell you a lot more. Um, I could not give you a complete overview. I uh, had to choose some applications where I hope I picked your interest. I could tell you a lot more maybe uh, about Cognitive Radar where our all, uh, institute is also active in applying uh, machine learning and other artificial intelligence based methods to the different radar applications. For the moment, um, I think I have given you a nice overview about current re uh, research. And um, with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you for your attention. And of course, I'm happy to answer your questions if there are any.